In the House of Commons at Westminster in 1875 sat a small group of Irish members who argued regularly but in vain for home rule for Ireland. One day in the chamber, an almost unknown Irish member, Charles Stuart Parnell, ended his maiden speech. Why should Ireland be treated as a geographical fragment of England, as I heard an ex-chancellor of the Exchequer call it some time ago? Ireland is not a geographical fragment, but a nation. The Irish nation in the 1870s was not particularly recognizable as a nation. The Irishman, citizen of the United Kingdom, with no Irish parliament for 70 years, had as his chief concern his well-being on the land, by which he and most of the Irish people lived. Pressure on the land had at least been eased by the Great Famine of the 1840s, and the larger farmer, had become more prosperous. The smaller tenant farmers, though there were fewer of them, still harvested their crops to pay the rent and survived largely on their potato plots. Good times in the mid-70s for small farmers meant times when they could survive without difficulty. But with the end of the 1870s, agricultural prices fell owing to foreign competition, and the small farmer couldn't pay his rent. There were two wet seasons with disastrous failures of the potato crop. Without enough to eat and unable to pay his rent, the small farmer began to be evicted. Evictions doubled in 1878 to the highest for over a decade. By 1880, they doubled again. Scenes reminiscent of the great famine of the 1840s were reappearing. As in the 1840s, Mass starvation loomed. Only two things prevented a second famine. One was a charity operation, mounted to a great extent from England, and mounted this time on a massive scale through two principal relief committees. A Dublin Mansion House Committee and a committee run by the Duchess of Marlborough. Thus, charity saved the Irish people. But the Irish people bitterly resented that they should need charity. And another saving factor was also at work. A former Fenian, Michael Davitt, was helping tenants organize to resist eviction and to demand lower rents. And he'd persuaded the young member of parliament for County Meath, Charles Stuart Parnell, who'd been increasingly making a name for himself on the Irish political scene, to take part in this land agitation. In bad times, a tenant cannot be expected to pay as much as he did in good times. Now, what must we do in order to induce the landlords to see the position? You must show them that you intend to hold a firm grip of your homestead and lands. You must not allow yourselves to be dispossessed as your fathers were dispossessed in 1847. So who exactly was this young politician David had got hold of to help him run his land campaign on behalf of the tenants? Well, the first strange thing about him is that he was a landlord and a Protestant landlord too, owning some 5,000 acres or so up here in County Wicklow, some of the most beautiful country in all Ireland. This is the solid 18th century country house, Avondale, 
where Parnell was born and spent his early childhood, and which he later owned and rather intermittently lived in for the rest of his life. Here, his father and mother had entertained in style the grand Protestant gentry of the neighborhood. But how, in spite of this family background, had Parnell now become a champion of the Irish people? Well, it wasn't really in spite of it at all. In a way, it was because of it. For Parnell traced his descent back on his father's side to that Protestant Irish tradition of independence from England of the 18th century, which had preceded the Union. His great-grandfather, Sir John Parnell, had been one of the Protestant patriots of that day and had strongly opposed the Union. Then again, his mother was American, and what's more, daughter of a famous American admiral, Charles Stuart, who'd whipped the British in the War of 1812. Parnell was named after him. A certain emotional detachment, then, from loyalty to British government was, you could say, in Parnell's bloodstream. And in this beautiful setting of his home at Avondale in County of Wicklow, it was bound to be a consciously Irish detachment for all his difference in class from those for whom he was fighting. Fighting, yes, well, that was something else about Parnell's personality that fitted him very well for the political role on which he was embarked. He had a very aggressive side to his nature, as well as a tender one. This may have had something to do with an early childhood experience, because when he was only six, he was sent away to boarding school in England and to a girls' school, too, at which he was the only boy. Resentment at this cruel rejection must have bitten deep into his character. Cambridge to which Parnell went in 1865 to read mathematics at Magdalen College. He had rooms on the ground floor overlooking this quad because he was known to be highly strung and given to sleepwalking. Highly strung, perhaps. Aggressive, certainly. Thinking of himself as an Irishman among Englishmen, and his days at Cambridge ended in an incident in a public street after which, rusticated by his college, he never came back. One evening, he spent half an hour with companions in Cambridge Station refreshment rooms, drinking champagne and sherry and eating biscuits. Emerging, he knocked down a local manure merchant who he thought had offended him, and was later in court, finally made to pay 20 pounds damages. Back in Wicklow the same summer, he got involved in another fight in a local hotel. Although this time, perhaps because Parnell knew the local magistrates, it was the other man who was fined. When Parnell first entered the House of Commons in 1875, mainly because he was at a bit of a loss what else to do, he very soon made a name for himself by his aggressiveness at question time and became one of a small group of extremists among the otherwise rather sedate and gentlemanly Irish members who routinely pleaded for an Irish parliament or home rule. One parliamentary correspondent in 1876 wrote this of Parnell. Something really must be done about Mr Parnell. Whether heaven has blessed Mr. Parnell with full measure of intelligence, or whether in the composition of his mind something material was omitted, are speculations interesting in themselves, but out of place in this journal. But I repeat, something really must be done about Mr. Parnell. Michael David summed him up more meaningfully when he described Parnell with his English education and his English accent as an Englishman of the strongest sort, moulded for an Irish purpose. Before long, Parnell was deeply involved in Davitt's land agitation and in the House of Commons. As the new leader of an increasingly vigorous Irish party, he was soon pursuing an Irish purpose there. Simultaneously, he was president of an Irish National Land League, founded with a central committee of former Fenians former Republicans believing in violence, to reduce rents, prevent evictions, 
and ultimately transfer land ownership from landlord to the tenant. And Parnell, running an open land league whose operators in the countryside quite often used illegal and violent methods, was heading into a political storm. Without official land league approval, landlords were being assassinated. Of course, officially, the Land League was a respectable body and didn't approve of violence. Violence was repeatedly deprecated by the Land League's president, Parnell, and by other members of the parliamentary party who were active in it. Sometimes, though, this disapproval was on a rather ambiguous note. Joseph Bigger, for instance, who was a one-time member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and now member of parliament for County Cavan, said categorically that the shooting of landlords was wrong. It was wrong, he said, because the assailant frequently missed the landlord and hit somebody else. Now, Parnell knew perfectly well that many of the top officials of the Land League were former Fenians. He'd had his own contacts with the Irish Republican Brotherhood and had actually been asked to join but had refused. What precisely, though, they were up to in the Land League, he was always careful not to know. In other words, he allowed the campaign to benefit from crude methods from which he was always able scrupulously to dissociate himself. It was a dangerous game, but the sort which every skilled politician needs to be able to master. In any case, Parnell was just about to add his own dimension of bitterness to the land war. In a speech at Ennis in September 1880, he asked his audience what was to be done with a man who took a farm from which another had been evicted. Now, I think I heard somebody say, shoot him. But I wish to point out to you a very much better way, a more Christian and more charitable way. When a man takes a farm from which another has been evicted. You must show him what you think of him on the roadside when you meet him and in the streets of the town. You must show him at the shop counter. You must show him at the fair and in the marketplace and even in the house of worship by leaving him severely alone by putting him into a sort of moral coventry, by isolating him from the rest of his kind as if he were a leper of old. One man in particular, a land agent, was to feel the full force of this treatment suggested by Parnell. Under police protection, he had to try and bring in his own harvest with help only from his family because no one else would work for him. His name gave a new word to the English language, boycott. A vast force of police and military escorted volunteer orangemen from the north to come and help him. The queerest menagerie that ever came into Connaught, as somebody put it. With the help of these volunteers from the north, Captain Boycott's harvest was eventually successfully brought in. But grateful to the Orangemen as he was for their services, he was in the end forced to leave the country. <laughs> Meanwhile, violence against those who broke the Land League's decrees continued. The boycott was applied to the police and those who took land from which another had been evicted were, as Parnell had proposed, duly shunned, ostracized, and treated as a leper of old. Acts of violence by men with blackened faces raiding the houses of those who didn't tow the Land League line multiplied. The police were increasingly required to deal with those who, with Land League support, violently resisted eviction. Gladstone, the Prime Minister, 
while obtaining from Parliament special powers to enforce the law, also got through Parliament a new land act. This made great concessions to the tenant farmer, setting up special land courts to decide a fair rent, whose decision a landlord had to accept. This Land Act also conferred complete security against eviction for the tenant farmer, provided he paid that legally established rent. Now, this was a revolutionary measure by the standards of uh, 19th century views on property, but it didn't please the extremists in the Land League who wanted to expropriate the landlords altogether. And Parnell, though he appreciated the benefits of the new Land Act, couldn't afford to antagonize extremists, particularly those who supported the Land League with money from America. With the violence continuing, Parnell continued to denounce Gladstone. And when, in September 1881, Gladstone addressed a meeting at Leeds, his patience broke its bounds as he had to face the fact that for all his land concessions, there were parts of Ireland in which the Queen's writ still did not run. If there is still to be fought in Ireland a final conflict between law on one side and sheer lawlessness on the other, then I say, gentlemen, without hesitation, the resources of civilization are not yet exhausted. Parnell replied at once. It is a good sign that this masquerading knight errant, this pretending champion of the rights of every other nation except those of the Irish nation, should be obliged to throw off the mask today and stand revealed as the man who, by his own utterances, is prepared to carry fire and sword into your homesteads unless you humbly abase yourselves before him and before the landlords of the country. Gladstone put the resources of civilization into action. It was the tyrant Gladstone, and he said unto himself, I never will be easy till Parnell is on the shelf. So make the warrant out in haste and take it by the mail, and we'll clap the pride of Erin's Isle into cold Kilmainham jail. A contemporary Dublin street ballad of 1881. Early in the morning of the 13th of October, 1881, in a room of Morrison's Hotel in Dublin, where he'd spent the night after coming down from Avondale, Parnell was arrested by a detective who served the warrant on him. Beside this wrong, all other wrongs of Ireland do grow pale for they've clapped the pride of Erin's Isle into cold Kilmainham jail. Parnell was lodged, not all that uncomfortably as it turned out, here in Kilmainham. It was a pretty cold, dank place, the best of times still is, but he was given the best cell, that one up there with two windows, about 21 feet by 18. It had a fireplace and he was allowed curtains and furniture and books, and he was let out of it for six hours a day for recreation, that is exercise and free association. He and the other Land League men who were arrested with him didn't have to wear prison clothes, but had newspapers and numerous visitors. These visitors brought him news he wasn't sorry to hear, that a Land League attempt to get farmers to pay no rent at all in opposition to the new Land Act was proving a failure. Politically, being sent to prison at this time was the best possible thing that could have happened to him. He was able to seem a martyr to the cause. At the same time, he was absolved from all responsibility for the continuing violence on the land, which he wanted to end anyway. This violence on the land was increasingly out of tune with the mood of the tenant farmers who were finding that the land courts set up by the new Land Act were fixing reasonable rents. And though there was a problem for those in arrears with their old rents, the return of better potato harvests and this successful working of the new Land Act meant 
that the crisis on the land was easing. But there was also another matter to which he now wished to turn his attention, of much more deeply personal concern to him. He had, the year before, made the acquaintance of Catherine, the attractive wife of an ambitious Irish member of parliament, Captain William O'Shea. After the meeting of parliament, Willie was insistent that I should give some dinner parties in London. And we arranged to have a couple of private rooms at Thomas's Hotel in Berkeley Square. We gave several dinners, and to each of them I invited Mr. Parnell. But in spite of acceptance of the invitation, Mr. Parnell did not come. One bright sunny day, I drove to the House of Commons and sent in a card asking Mr. Parnell to come out and speak to me in Palace Yard. He came out, a tall, gaunt figure, thin and deadly pale. He looked straight at me, smiling. This was the beginning of a love affair that was to last for the rest of Parnell's life. Catherine O'Shea seems early to have convinced him that her marriage was no longer anything but a formality. And by the time he was sent to kill Maynham, she was already pregnant by him. The fact that she was still legally married to William O'Shea, a former captain of the 18th Hussars and Member of Parliament, seems not to have troubled Parnell at all, who thought of her as his own wife. My dearest wifey, I'm very comfortable here, and I have a beautiful room facing the sun. The best in the prison. There are three or four of the best of the men in adjoining rooms, with whom I can associate all day long so the time does not hang heavy, nor do I feel lonely. My only fear is about my darling Queenie. I have been racked with torture all today, last night and yesterday, lest the shock may have hurt you or our child. Oh, darling, write or wire me as soon as you get this that you are well and will try not to be unhappy until you see your husband again. You may wire me here. I have your beautiful face with me here. It is such a comfort. So Parnell wanted to get out of Kilmainham for a deep personal reason, as well as a political one. His growing conviction that it was time now to go for some alliance with the Liberals for Ireland's national ideals. The personal reason strengthened the political reason. Sometimes he wrote to her not just as husband to wife, but as king to queen. Your king thinks very, very often of his dearest queen and wishes her not to be sad, but to try to be happy for his sake. Discreet negotiations were carried on between Gladstone and Parnell while he was here in Kilmainham. And in February 1882, Parnell was released on parole to attend the funeral of a nephew who'd died in Paris. He did go to Paris, but on his way, he stopped at Eltham to see his first child, a daughter to whom Mrs. O'Shea had just given birth, but who was ill and died almost immediately. Meanwhile, the discreet negotiations for Parnell's final release continued. One of the negotiators being none other than Catherine's husband, William O'Shea. It was, and was long to continue to be, a strange affair. Parnell was released from here altogether in May 1882 under a tacit agreement that's come to be known as the Kilmainham Treaty, though in fact nothing was written down. All now seemed set fair for a course of collaboration between the Irish Home Rule Party and Gladstone's Liberals. Then, out of the blue, came a terrible event. The Chief Secretary for Ireland, W.E. Forster, angered by the release of Parnell, resigned and was replaced by Gladstone's nephew, Lord Frederick Cavendish, who arrived in Ireland on the 6th of May, 1882. 
At about half past seven on the evening of his arrival in Dublin, Lord Frederick Cavendish was walking back from Dublin Castle across Phoenix Park here towards the Vice Regal Lodge over there, together with his undersecretary, a Catholic Irishman named Thomas Burke, when they were set upon by a gang armed with 12-inch surgical knives. One report has it that Lord Frederick Cavendish had a go at them with his umbrella, but it didn't do him much good. Both he and Burke were soon lying hacked to death on the roadway here. The assassins belonged to a secret society called the Invincibles and were eventually executed for murder. But they'd also killed, for a time at least, all chance of that alliance between Parnell and Gladstone's Liberals on which Parnell was counting for a really effective move towards home rule. In his woods at Avondale, Parnell now had to face the fact that many Liberals' mistrust of Irish nationalism, was it really as moderate as home rule made it sound, was much increased by knowing that however respectable Parnell himself could make it sound, dark deeds like the Phoenix Park murder could also be committed in its name. Parnell himself was often ambiguous about what he really meant by insisting that Ireland was a nation. So, would a domestic home rule parliament fully satisfy Ireland's national demand? Or would it just be the first step towards a demand for fuller independence or even separation? This was what puzzled Gladstone, the Prime Minister, who knew quite well that neither he nor the Liberal Party could ever accept separation. And looking at Parnell's speeches in the past did little to solve that puzzle. In a speech at Cincinnati in the United States in 1880, Parnell had been reported as saying, When we have undermined English misgovernment, we have paved the way for Ireland to take her place among the nations of the earth. And let us not forget that is the ultimate goal at which all we Irishmen aim. None of us, whether we are in America or Ireland, or wherever we may be, will be satisfied until we have destroyed the last link which keeps Ireland bound to England. But the point of home rule was meant to be that it satisfied Irish national feeling while preserving the link. At other times, Parnell himself did make it sound as if it was just this that he wanted. My advice to English statesmen would be this. Give our people the power to legislate upon all their domestic concerns and you may depend on one thing, that the desire for separation, the means of winning separation, at least will not be increased or intensified. The hope of converting English liberals to home rule lay not only in persuading them that the demand for separation would not be intensified, but that it would be stilled altogether. Yet, at public meetings, in Ireland at least, Parnell kept his options open. Although our program may be limited and small, it should be such a one as shall not prevent hereafter the fullest realization of the hopes of Ireland. With speeches like this, the Protestant landlord from County Wicklow had made himself the uncrowned King of Ireland. In the circumstances, it was a political gamble for the Prime Minister Gladstone when, eventually, in 1886, he decided to introduce a Home Rule Bill into the House of Commons with the argument that Home Rule would keep Ireland forever within the British Empire. The concession of local self-government is not the way to separation and independence, but the way to strengthen and consolidate Unity. And Parnell now pledged himself to regard this home rule, a parliament in Dublin for all Ireland with limited domestic powers only, as giving Ireland all the sense of national pride she needed. We look upon the provision of this bill as a final settlement of this question. And I believe that the Irish people have accepted it as such a settlement. 
Not a single dissentient voice has been raised against the bill by any Irishman holding national opinions. But what about those not holding national opinions? About one quarter of the entire Irish population concentrated mainly in Ulster. They were already beginning to drill and threaten to resist any attempt by the government to impose home rule upon them. I think the best compliment I can pay to those who have threatened us is to take no notice of the threats, to treat them as momentary ebullitions which will pass away with the fears from which they spring. I cannot conceal my conviction that the voice of Ireland as a whole is constitutionally spoken. I cannot say it is otherwise when five-sixths of its lawfully chosen representatives are of one mind on this matter. I cannot allow it to be said that a Protestant minority in Ulster or elsewhere is to rule the question at large for Ireland. I'm aware of no constitutional doctrine tolerable on which such a conclusion could be adopted or justified. Various schemes have been proposed, including the uh, exclusion of a portion of uh, Ulster from the operation of the bill or a separate autonomy for that portion of Ulster. But no one of these has appeared to us to be completely justified, either upon its merits or by the weight of opinion supporting and recommending it as to warrant our including it in the bill and proposing it uh, to Parliament upon our responsibility. On the question of the Ulster Protestants, Parnell used the strongest argument of all for nationalist Irishmen wanting to include Protestants in the new Home Rule Ireland. We cannot give up a single Irishman. We want the patriotism, the talents, and the work of every Irishman to ensure that this great experiment shall be a successful one. The best system of government should be the resultant of what forces are in that country. The class of Protestants will form a most valuable element in the Irish legislature of the future, constituting, as they will, a strong minority and exercising a moderating influence on making laws. We want all creeds and classes in Ireland. We cannot consent to look upon a single Irishman as not belonging to us. But neither Parnell's nor Gladstone's arguments had succeeded in dispelling the fears of the House of Commons as a whole, or even the whole Liberal Party. The Liberal Party itself split and part of it voted with the Conservative opposition. The Home Rule Bill was lost in the House of Commons on the second reading by 30 votes. Though the Home Rule Bill of 1886 was lost in the House of Commons as a result of the Liberal defection, the defeat wasn't as depressing to most Irishmen as one might expect. The way they saw it then was that it was even a sort of triumph that a British government had put Home Rule forward at all and that it was now inscribed on the banner of one of the two main British political parties, the Liberals. Parnell now bided his time until political fortune should once again give the Irish party the balance between Liberals and Conservatives in the House of Commons. Meanwhile, other, more personal considerations dominated his life. Much of Parnell's time was now spent living in England with the woman with whom he'd fallen in love six years before, Catherine O'Shea, still married to William O'Shea, but in Parnell's eyes, his own loving wife, which to Parnell was the same as saying, his wife in the sight of God. They'd lived together at Mrs. O'Shea's house at Eltham in Kent. 
But Captain O'Shea, who had at first encouraged their association for the political benefits he hoped to get out of it, increasingly objected. And they had to resort to subterfuges and take houses under an assumed name in different parts of southern England, particularly in Hove near Brighton in Sussex. Parnell was now frequently absent from the House of Commons, and his parliamentary colleagues, over whom he still held unquestioned mastery for all his absences, often had no idea where he was. One morning, as they were breakfasting together, he received an unpleasant shock from the Times. The Times of the 18th of April, 1887, carried the facsimile of what purported to be a letter signed by Parnell five years before, apologizing to someone for having publicly condemned the Phoenix Park murders, but saying he had to do this as a matter of policy. That evening in the House of Commons, he called the letter categorically a villainous and barefaced forgery. But he didn't sue the Times. Some months later, the Times published other letters equally purporting to show that Parnell had been in league with those who committed crimes on the land in Ireland. The great majority of them are palpable forgeries. They bear the look of forgery on their very face. But there was something about his denial which didn't wholly convince those who wanted to believe that Parnell had, in fact, in the days of the Land League, had close connections with those who perpetrated crime. There was a delay of over a year after the publication of the first letter before, eventually, a special commission was set up by the government to investigate the letters. This special commission did, in fact, reveal some embarrassing connections between the Land League and certain members of the Parliamentary Party, but on the issue of the letters, Parnell was triumphantly cleared when a former nationalist journalist, Richard Piggott, who had been put under pressure by Parnell's counsel, was exposed before the commission and fully confessed to the journalist and Liberal MP, Henry Labouchere, that he had forged those letters. Piggott afterwards committed suicide. Parnell was given an ovation when he next entered the House of Commons. In public, he now seemed at the very height of his political acclaim. But disaster in the shape of Captain William O'Shea, husband of Parnell's mistress Catherine, was waiting in the wings. O'Shea had held his hand so far because he was waiting for a rich aunt of Catherine's, Mrs. Benjamin Wood, who was expected to leave her a fortune, to die. When Aunt Ben eventually died at the age of 96, O'Shea sued for divorce. Parnell and Mrs. O'Shea had, apparently quite innocently, visited Aunt Ben in her large house at Eltham in her lifetime. They now hoped to buy O'Shea off with part of the fortune which Aunt Ben had duly left Catherine. But the family disputed the will, they didn't have the money, and the divorce went forward undefended, though Mrs O'Shea maintained that her husband had connived at the affair. Divorces in those days were held before a judge and jury, but the judge was sceptical about the plea of connivance. If the husband was really a consenting party, Mr. Parnell would have stood in a better position than he does at present because, although it is an immoral, improper and reprehensible thing to indulge in an intimacy of this kind with a married woman, whether the husband is a consenting party or not. Nevertheless, the man who stands in that position 
is, to some extent, not so guilty, or so blatantly so, as the man who takes advantage of the hospitality of a husband to debauch the wife. If there had been any kind of encouragement on part of the husband, or if he had been shutting his eyes to what was going on, what would have been the use of all this denial on the part of the respondent and the correspondent? Why should there have been all these disguises? Why the assumption by Mr. Parnell of names which do not belong to him, such as Fox and Preston and a number of others? But above all, why? When the husband comes to the door of one of the houses in Brighton, why should Mr. Parnell, who was in the drawing room with Mrs. O'Shea, have gone out onto the balcony, descended by the fire escape, and then have come round to the front door as if he were an ordinary visitor and asked for Captain O'Shea? And all these matters, to my mind, constitute an absolute answer in favor of Captain O'Shea in regard to this charge of connivance. The effect of this sort of thing on Catholic Ireland and on that non-conformist opinion in England, which was the backbone of the Liberal Party's support, was devastating. The immediate question was whether or not Parnell should continue as leader of the Irish Party. And characteristically, he never for a moment seems to have doubted that he should. But there were many in his party who thought this would be disastrous, and Gladstone declared that if Parnell were to remain leader of the Irish party, his own leadership of the Liberal Party would be, as he put it, rendered almost a nullity. In the end, a stormy and traumatic meeting of Irish members of Parliament took place in Committee Room 15 of the House of Commons. The climax went as follows. One member said, if the party rejects Parnell, it will, in effect, be placing itself under Gladstone's leadership. Gladstone's not a member of the Irish party, came a cry. He's the master of the party, came another. At which Tim Healy, MP for South Londonderry, who'd long resented this aspect of Parnell's leadership, called out, who is to be the mistress of the party? Parnell rose in fury, and it seemed for a moment as if he'd become violent. Someone said, I appeal to my friend, the chairman. Better appeal to that cowardly little scoundrel who dares in an assembly of Irishmen to insult a woman. Parnell was voted out of the leadership of the Irish party, which now split into an anti-Parnellite party and a much smaller Parnellite party led by Parnell. It was the eventual overwhelming condemnation of the Catholic Church, which was to turn the tide against him in Ireland. Now began the fiercest and most tragic struggle of Parnell's life, as he fought in Ireland a losing battle against the Church's power. It drove him to desperate methods, as in a succession of by-elections, he tried to shift the issue away from one of the question of his own fitness to lead the party to one of Ireland's pride. Was the Irish party really going to be dictated to by an English statesman, Gladstone? In this desperation, Parnell turned more and more to his old allies of the Land League days, the Fenians or Hillside men, who could be relied on to see nationalism as a more important abstract cause than that of morality. A year before, he'd been the uncrowned King of Ireland. Now he lost three by-elections in a row, at one of which lime was thrown in his eyes. His health deteriorated. He'd married Catherine after the divorce and was living with her in a house at Walsingham Terrace, Hove. On Sunday the 27th of September, 1891, speaking in Dublin, he said he'd be back in Ireland on Saturday week, October the 10th. He was a few hours out in his forecast. He died at Hove with his wife by his side on October the 6th. His body was brought into Kingstown Harbour on Sunday morning, October the 11th, and was taken through Dublin to Glasnevin Cemetery.
My mother, when she was a little girl of 11 or 12, was brought to the funeral by her father. And she remembered all the people, millions, of, as she thought, of people going to this funeral. She was there from early morning. They were waiting for the hearse to come along. And when the hearse came, there was a horse behind it. And the saddle and bridle were on the horse, and the boots were turned backwards. And she asked her father uh, why the boots were backward, and he told her that it was because of the death of one of Ireland's very greatest men and also the death of Ireland's hopes. And he told her that it was a day she must remember all her life. And then she looked up at her father and she saw the tears running down his face. And she looked around and saw all the men and women crying. But what impressed her most really was the fact that the men were crying because she had never seen a man cry in her life. The attitude that had broken Parnell and divided Catholic Ireland was expressed by a priest preaching a sermon in the next year in a church in Parnell's own county of Wicklow. Parnellism is the simple love of adultery. And those who profess Parnellism profess to love and admire adultery. They are an adulterous set. Their leaders are open and avowed adulterers. And so I say to you as parish priest, beware of these Parnellites when they enter your house, you that have wives and daughters. For they will do all they can to commit these adulteries. Their cause is not patriotism, it is adultery. And they back Parnellism because it gratifies their adultery. But the cause for which Parnell had fought so hard was to survive all that. And when, 20 years later, home rule did become law, even that was not to be the end. No man has a right to fix the boundary to the march of a nation. No man has a right to say to his country, thus far shalt thou go and no further. Mm -hmm.